Come enjoy the natural beauty of Connecticut. Except in Trumbull and Monroe counties, you might get attacked by bulbous troglodytes. These words greeted me when I first looked into the iceberg and began research for this video. Anyway, let's begin. Good evening everyone. As in the past, I'll be going through an iceberg posted over on Reddit. For the uninitiated, icebergs contain information on a page in descending tiers. As we go down this iceberg of information, it transitions from more well-known entries and begins to go deeper into a subject. I'll be skipping the first tier in favor of getting to the more obscure entries quickly. I hope you enjoy the video. New Britain Located closely near the dead center of the state, New Britain is known as the Hardware City due to its past history as a manufacturing center and that the company Black & Decker has its headquarters within it. It possesses art museums and multiple community theaters along with Central Connecticut State University. New London New London was once a base for American privateers during the Revolutionary War and was later burned by a massive British fleet led by Benedict Arnold. Later on, it became a great whaling port after it was fully reconstructed. Nowadays, it's the home of the Coast Guard Academy and a Navy nuclear submarine base and school. A lot of the current economy in New London actively involves the maintenance and construction of nuclear submarines. Lake Compounds this lake contains the oldest continuously operating amusement park in the U.S., which was opened in 1846. It even has a still operating wooden roller coaster from 1927, called the Wildcat. New Haven Style Pizza Originating from the town of the same name, this is a thin crust pizza that is considered to be a relative to the New York style pizza. It's a dish that is heavily localized to this part of Connecticut. The Whalers. This hockey team was founded in Boston in 1974 and played in Hartford up until 1997. The team was later relocated to Raleigh, North Carolina in 1997 and was renamed the Carolina Hurricanes. Their move was considered a great loss to Hartford and Connecticut as a whole, with one fan in 1997 saying, it was like losing. A family member. The Whalers still live on in the culture of the town, with their logo and fight song, Brass Bonanza, still seen and heard throughout Connecticut. Now, 25 years later, as of 2023, the governor of the state, Ned Lamont, is working on bringing the team back. It's still up in the air, but the current Phoenix Coyotes NHL team has been looking for a stadium. While, as of December, the team is looking to build a new stadium somewhere in North Arizona. Connecticut has been looking to see if they would accept the Coyotes as the new Whalers. Waterbury This city, located near the Naugatuck River in West Connecticut, was a massive producer of brassware in the 20th century, earning it the nickname Brass City. CT Science Center Resting in downtown Hartford, the Connecticut Science Center is a non-for-profit museum that features over 165 hands-on exhibits, a 3D theater, four labs, and an indoor tropical butterfly habitat. Nutmeggers. The Nutmeg State is the unofficial nickname of Connecticut, and as a result, people originating from Connecticut are often called nutmeggers, or call themselves that. Yankee peddlers who sold fake wooden nutmegs was an old story told throughout the early U.S. Those not familiar with this particular nut tried to crack them open to get into the contents, when in reality it was supposed to be grated to be used as a spice. Mount Frissle, South Slope Mount Frissle is designated as lying within the boundaries of Massachusetts. Its southern slope extends into Connecticut and is the tallest peak in the state at 2,380 feet, 
despite the tallest peak of the mountain lying higher up at 2,453 feet within Massachusetts. Mystic Seaport The Mystic River was once the site of a booming shipbuilding industry, with over 600 vessels constructed over the course of almost two and a half centuries. After the Great War, the shipbuilding companies stopped work as less and less companies and individuals required wooden ships. In 1929, a group of men got together to form the Marine Historical Association, which became the Mystic Seaport Museum. Today, the museum contains over 1 million maritime photography images and around 525 boats, along with 2 million instances of other maritime artifacts. In the late 1990s, the Mystic Seaport did a cool project that saw them construct a schooner called the Amistad. The work began in 1998, and the schooner launched in 2000. Norwich Nicknamed the Rose of New England, this town of 40,000 people is next to a harbor in which three rivers flow. Interestingly, this town was also the birthplace of Benedict Arnold. I have a feeling that he might keep showing up in this iceberg. Fairfield This city was the home of the Pogasset peoples for thousands of years before the English pushed them out of the region. This town often faced raids from pro-imperial forces during the War for Independence, and, similar to many other towns on this list, was burned by the British, although this time it wasn't Benedict Arnold. Many wealthy people who work in New York City reside in Fairfield today. Mama Bear Struggles with Cubs Viral Video This roughly three minute video consists of a bear in Connecticut desperately trying to move all three of her cubs, I might have miscounted, might have been four, across a two lane road. The drivers patiently waited throughout the entire event. Old Saybrook Another Native American village that became a settlement, Old Saybrook is a coastal town that is known for its beautiful views of Long Island Sound. Willimantic, called Thread City for its former thriving textile industry, this town derived its name from a tribal word that is said to have translated to Place of the Swift Running Waters. Back in the late 1800s, the town was practically owned by the mills and had dozens of company-sponsored organizations, activities, and parks. The Windham Company and American Thread Company parks can still be seen today, although now they're under new names. Pepe's Pizza This chain operates throughout the state of Connecticut and is called the home of the New Haven-style pizza. Groton The town of Groton lies near the Mystic River. This town was an American privateer base during the American Revolution, and the population was later eradicated by Benedict Arnold. Groton became the submarine capital of the world during World War II and beyond, constructing 74 diesel submarines from the war effort and building the USS Nautilus, the world's first nuclear-powered submarine. It's still the home of a Navy base today. George W. Bush was born in Connecticut. Yeah, he was born there. <laughs> First burger was created in New Haven. Louis Lunch is reputed to be the first restaurant in the U.S. to serve hamburgers in 1900. It's currently the oldest restaurant in the U.S. serving hamburgers. Pepperidge Farm was created in Connecticut. Now located in Norfolk, this company, known for inventing the goldfish cracker, was originally founded in Fairfield, Connecticut in 1937. Kila Natasha, and Juno. These three beluga whales live in an aquarium in Stonington. One of their most prominent social media appearances was in a short video in which the beluga whales listened intently to a violinist who played next to their tank. They appeared to be enjoying the music. The Story of the Charter Oak The legend of the Charter Oak began in 1687, when the colony of Connecticut refused to give up its charter during a heated exchange with the newly arrived envoys of the British Empire. 
the charter had been given to the colony by King Charles II. However, the new king, James II, had sent representatives to tell the colonists that they would have to give up the rights they possessed and be subject to the restrictions put in place over the New England Territory. It was said that all the candles within the schoolhouse where the delegates were meeting suddenly went out. In the midst of the darkness and confusion, the colony charter disappeared and was hidden by a colonist named Captain Joseph Wadsworth within the trunk of a large white oak tree that was hollowed out. The colony became part of the newly formed Dominion of New England. The charter remained hidden until King William and Mary returned to England during the Bloodless Revolution in 1689. They reinstated the terms of the charter, and it was a core part of the Connecticut State Constitution up until 1818. In 1856, the Charter Oak fell. Its role in Connecticut history was commemorated with a funeral, with the tree later being covered with a large American flag. Today, many parks and other locations throughout the state are named after the legend of the Charter Oak. There's even a chair in the state senate carved out of the wood of the tree. Merritt Parkway This parkway was constructed in the mid-1930s. One of the most distinctive features of the highway are the distinctive signs and 69 elaborate overpasses which go down the length of the road. It was celebrated at the time for the way it complemented the surrounding countryside. As of now, the Merritt Parkway has been designated as a state scenic road and has earned a spot on the National Register of Historic Places. Sonny's Place This small amusement park features mini golf, rock climbing, an arcade, and go-karts. It's located in Somers. Quiet Corner The northeast region of Connecticut has this nickname due to the fact that it's relatively rural compared to the other parts of the region. It's one of the last remaining dark spots where starlight can still be seen in this part of the northeast. Mansfield This town is home to the small community of stores. The first silk mill in the country opened in this place in 1810, and Mansfield became a massive producer of silk, with its industry remaining strong well into the middle of the 19th century. After the silk boom ended, Mansfield turned its focus to education in 1881. The Storrs Agricultural School, which later became the University of Connecticut, was founded in Mansfield. Connecticut is a ghost magnet. The state features a lot of haunted places. Here are a couple I found interesting. Booth Memorial Park was an attraction, opened in the early 1900s. The Booth brothers, who opened the homestead to the public, were said to have been caught up in the spiritualism movement and deeply involved in occult practices. They built shrines around the property and inside some of the homestead buildings, which is said to have opened the door for supernatural events to occur. The Devil's Hop Yard is another state park that is closely linked to the stories of the Puritans who moved into the region southeast of present-day Hartford. The colonists said that the round, even holes that decorate the stone in this section of the state were caused by the devil. The story goes that whenever the devil passed by the falls, he continually kept getting his goat tail wet. This greatly angered him, so he burned holes in the stones with his hooves as he bounded away. There's an additional story that ties into this site. During the early period of the colonial era, a lone traveler was traversing the woods. He saw some shapeless forms emerge and leap from the trees surrounding the falls. These phantoms attacked the man. He fought them off and ran as fast as he could to the nearest town, where he entered the local tavern. He then told his account to anyone who would listen. Gillette Castle Originally called the Seventh Sister Castle by the man who built it, Gillette Castle is a monument above the town of Lyme that was constructed over the course of five years in the 1910s. Gillette was an actor 
who was well known at the time for his portrayal of Sherlock Holmes on the stage. He commissioned the project and oversaw the construction and design of both the interior and exterior of the castle. He even planned secret passageways throughout the structure, as he wanted to fully recreate a medieval European castle. The Flood of 55 This flood resulted from two back-to-back -back hurricanes depositing water in the valleys of Connecticut in August 1955. It ranks among the worst floods recorded in the state's history. Many towns, notably Farmington, Putnam, Nagatuck, Waterbury, and Winstead, were devastated. 87 people were killed and over $200 million in 1955 cash and damage was inflicted. Holy Land. This theme park, which has many attractions based on passages of scripture, was opened in Waterbury in 1955. John Greco, a first-generation Italian immigrant and Catholic, had previously attended seminary in Bloomfield, Connecticut, and at another school in Baltimore. He later went on to Yale Law School and became a lawyer. He founded the Connecticut chapter of the Catholic Campaigners for Christ, organization. He decided to create more interest in the Christian faith through building a theme park. He, along with a group of volunteers, spent his free time on a nearby hill, creating over 100 buildings to simulate Jerusalem and Bethlehem as described in the Bible. He crafted golden calves, built an exhibit on the Shroud of Turin, and even constructed catacombs that extended underground for over 200 feet. The park attracted over 40,000 visitors a year at the height of its popularity. Greco's health began to deteriorate in the 80s, forcing him to close the park in 1984. He could find no one who was willing to operate the park. Greco passed away in 1986, with an order of nuns called the Religious Teachers Filippini taking care of the park. The weather and repeated vandalism began to erode the Holy Land. In 2013, the Waterbury mayor purchased the park and, with the help of a local businessman, raised money to restore the park. Volunteers helped with the process and eventually reopened in 2014. Old Stone Walls Stone walls that once delineated properties during the colonial era can still be seen all over the state today. Mountain Lion Sightings There's been several recorded instances of mountain lions making an appearance in Connecticut. One of the more interesting cases I've read about was a 2011 sighting in Milford when a 140-pound mountain lion was hit by a car and killed. Environmental officials, after receiving data from the body, determined that the animal originated from the Black Hills of South Dakota. Much of the mountain lion's journey was recorded by trail cams running between the Midwest and New England. Castle Craig This tower in central Connecticut, along with a tract of surrounding land, was donated to the public in the early 20th century by an industrialist named Walter Hubbard. It offers a great view of the surrounding area and it is possible to see the town of Meriden and several other neighboring towns as well. Battle of Stonington Stonington was greeted by the sight of a British fleet on the day of August 9th in 1814. The War of 1812 was well underway, and this squadron decided to anchor off the Stonington Point near the town. The man leading the fleet, Captain Thomas Hardy, sent a message to the townspeople, giving them an hour to get out of town before he commenced a bombardment. Some people, primarily women and young children, left and took shelter in the surrounding countryside. The militia in the village began to fire on the British with an 18-pounder, and a call for reinforcements was put out to the neighboring towns. A note was sent to the British. It read, We shall defend the place to the last extremity. The bombardment lasted for three days. 
Incredibly, the Americans only suffered one casualty during the entire engagement. The British left on the 12th after suffering great casualties. Windsor Locks Tornado of 73. This tornado, according to my research, occurred in 1979, not 1973. An F4 class tornado touched down in north central Connecticut in the afternoon of October 3rd. Within 10 minutes, it traveled 11 miles through Windsor, Windsor Locks, and into southern Massachusetts. It grew to be almost 1,400 yards wide and caused $400 million in damage in 1979 money. Hartford Circus Fire It was July 6th, 1944. Thousands of people had gathered together to see the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus in a 500 foot long Big Top Ten. The French lion tamer Alfred Kaur had finished his performance and a pair of trapeze artists named the Great Walendas were starting their show. A attendee Standing outside the tent, carelessly tossed their spent cigarette near the partition leading to the men's restroom. A fire began and rapidly spread along the tent, as the thick canvas was treated with a waterproofing substance called paraffin wax, which had been thinned using gasoline. One of the performers yelled, The tent's on fire! And the band in the tent began playing Stars and Stripes Forever a predetermined signal that told the employees of the circus that danger was imminent. The flames rose to almost 100 feet high within the tent, and the audience fled as fast as they could. People cut through the canvas to make emergency exits, as the ends of the tent filled with others trying to escape. The circus employees rushed in with buckets of water, but within 10 minutes, the fire destroyed the support poles and sent the tent down. The owners of the circus were charged with negligence after the event, as the fire extinguishers belonging to the company were still in storage at the time. However, there's a twist. Six years later, a man named Robert Dale Segui was arrested in Ohio and interrogated by the police. He had been accused of setting multiple fires had been sentenced to serve 40 years in jail for arson. During the interrogation, Segui revealed that he had set the fire at the Hartford Circus. He had worked as an employee at the show for several years. In the end, Segui was diagnosed with schizophrenia and committed to the Ohio State Hospital. Panamite Yankee Wars these wars were fought between 1769 and 1784, with protracted breaks in between. Settlers from both Pennsylvania and Connecticut claimed that a 23-mile tract of land that bordered the Susquehanna River belonged to them. This area was known as the Wyoming Valley and featured fertile plains that were ripe for cultivation. King Charles II had given the valley to Connecticut in 1662, before later deciding to give it to Pennsylvania as well, in 1681. In 1768, a development company in Hartford got together to divide the valley and establish five villages. However, when the settlers sent to establish these villages arrived, they found that the Penamites had already arrived. Penamite was a term for people originating from Pennsylvania. Fighting began to erupt between the two groups and continued onwards for many years. In the First Pennamite War, the Connecticut settlers began to construct two forts, Durkee Fort and Forty Fort. The Pennamites built the forts of Wyoming and Ogden on the side of the river closest to Pennsylvania to stop them. Skirmishes began with both battles and deaths going either mostly unrecorded or inaccurately reported by each side. In 1763, a local Indian chief was killed. His son blamed the Connecticut settlers and raided their village, taking out two dozen people and finishing the war. Later on, during the Revolutionary War, the armed men in the Connecticut settlement 
left to go fight for the Americans. A British officer named John Butler saw the resentment between the Penamites and the other settlers, and recruited loyalists, along with local Native Americans, to go attack Forty Fort. The men in the fort charged out to attack the larger invading force, and 227 Connecticut men and an unrecorded amount of British and Native Americans lost their lives. It was reported that both the British and Native Americans took scalps from their enemies during the conflict. The Penamites burned all of the village and left the forts in ruins. The women and children ran into the woods near the valley and survived until reinforcements could arrive. The conflict finally ended when the federal government stepped in and decreed the valley to be part of Pennsylvania and granted the surviving Connecticut settlers full rights to the properties they had established. Travis the Chimp Sandra Harold adopted a baby chimp named Travis in 1995. She had bought him from a breeder in Missouri for $50,000. Sandra and her husband Jerry regularly gave Travis attention and retrofitted their house to accommodate the chimpanzee. Sandra dressed him up regularly, and the couple even let the chimp sleep with them. Travis ate at the table with them and was capable of eating his meals with forks and spoons. In 2000, the Herald's only child died in a car accident. Jerry Herald's later passed away in 2005 after being diagnosed with stomach cancer. At this point, Travis was nearing adulthood and weighed around 200 pounds. These stresses in Sandra Harold's life were distinctly felt by the chimp. In 2009, Travis mauled a friend of Sandra Harold's named Charla Nash. Travis had escaped the house that morning, and Nash had arrived to help locate him and put him back. Travis attacked her, and despite Harold's attempts to dislodge him with a shovel and then a knife, continued to attack Nash. Harold called the police, and they arrived on the scene within minutes. Travis headed towards the first car to respond to the scene and attempted to open the passenger door. He went around the car to attack the police officer in the driver's seat. The cop fired four times at point-blank range, taking out Travis. Nash survived the attack, but had to undergo extended surgery. It was later revealed that Harold had fed the chimp some Xanax the morning of the event, a medication intended to treat anxiety and panic disorders in humans. The drug most likely fueled Travis's aggression and caused hallucinations and mania. This case led to Connecticut lawmakers drafting legislation that prohibited citizens from owning mammals that weighed over 50 pounds as pets. Melon Heads This legend has versions throughout Ohio, Michigan, and Connecticut. The most common version of the story, originating from Ohio, says that there was once an asylum deep in the woods near Chardon Township. The federal government founded the institution and designated a man named Crow to run the institution. The federal government sent him a group of children affected with hydrocephalus, a condition in which individuals have large pockets of water within their brains. Crow took good care of the children and treated them kindly ensuring their safety as he looked to find a cure for their condition. Unfortunately, he passed away from natural causes, and the children were left on their own. It's said that they continued to live in the woods for decades, hiding in the deteriorating asylum and living off the land as best as they could. The darker version of the tale is that Crow was performing experiments on them that caused their condition to worsen. As a result, the children took out Crow, destroyed the building, and then ran away into the woods. They then formed a society and reproduced, going into nearby farmsteads to kidnap people and steal livestock. Cryptozoologists and high school students from the area who have made the journey to the area have said that they have spotted melon heads in these woods for decades. The Fairfield County, Connecticut versions seems slightly more probable. The first version states that the Melonheads are the descendants of a group of inmates 
who fled an asylum in the fall of 1960. Their appearance is said to result from hydrocephalus caused by inbreeding. The second Connecticut variation says that the melon heads are descendants of a colonial area family that lived in Shelton, Trumbull. The family was banished after accusations of witchcraft and became more grotesque as a curse began to afflict them. Battle of the Frogs This Windham legend, set in 1754, involves an incident that was caused by the croaking of thousands of bullfrogs congregating in a pond next to the village of Windham during a horrendous drought. The citizens heard the loud croaking and began to panic and assume they were under attack. This was during the French and Indian War, with citizens interpreting the sounds as shouted words or the beating of war drums. VO This logo can be seen throughout Connecticut. These symbols range from three letters, with the O often seen with a diagonal slash mark through it. In other cases, the O is replaced by an infinity sign, or an I. VEO can be found shortened to just VO, or extended to VO. The logo is a popular graffiti tag that can be found just about anywhere you look, in many parts of the state. People in Maine, Indiana, and Ohio, and even further west, have reported spotting the tag as well. The Leatherman This nomad wandered around the Connecticut, New York countryside from 1858 to 1889. He wore a suit stitched together from leather bootlegs and carried a French prayer book. He understood English and French, but spoke very little. He would stop in small towns and villages to look for food. He would knock on doors, and if anyone answered, he would pantomime that he needed to eat. The Leatherman would take his meals, eat them outside before going back on his path, and would typically return to the house around a month later. If the residents refused to give him food, he would not return. His route was consistent, and he became a fixture within many of these communities along his 365 mile long circuit. It was rumored that his name was Charles Borglay, and that he was a Crimean War veteran. These remained rumors as the Leatherman would disclose no personal details. In the winter of 1888, he was diagnosed with mouth cancer and moved to a hospital. He stayed in the hospital for a few hours before gathering his possessions and leaving again. He passed away soon after. His grave in the wilderness was marked with a headstone in the 1950s. He was given the name Jules Borglay on the ep epitaph. In 2011, his grave was exhumed with the hope that his DNA could be tested and his identity finally revealed. However, his bones were gone. Judges Cave Wally, Goff, and Dixwell were three judges who had helped sentence King Charles the Martyr to death in 1649. Charles II, his son, regained power in 1660. He ordered the immediate hanging, drawing, and quartering of all the judges. These three, desperate to avoid that grisly punishment, fled to the colonies. Dixwell hid in New Haven, while the other two went to Boston. A warrant for their arrest was issued soon after they arrived. Local Puritans, sympathetic to them, helped the judges hide deep in the woods. Their hiding spot was a large rock in present-day West Rock Ridge State Park. Several weeks later, after a close encounter with the panther, they relocated to Hadley, Massachusetts, and lived there for the rest of their lives. Today, you can still see the Judge's Cave, but you'll need to find the path leading up to the location, a path called Regicide's Trail. The Jewett City Vampires The Ray family in Jewett City had experienced much tragedy over the course of nine years. Since 1845, the family had lost their father and two sons to tuberculosis. In 1854, the oldest son, Henry Ray, began to come down with the symptoms of the now deceased family members. 
Henry was a valuable breadwinner for the family, and the two sons who had died were full adults who could have provided for the family as well. If Henry died, the Rays would be in an even worse position. As a result, the family believed that the dead were vampires who were slowly killing Henry. They dug up the bodies of the two sons, they didn't want to disturb the father, and burned them. This belief spread to the surrounding area, and archaeologists have found dozens of other bodies from the same era that were missing heads or driven through by stakes to hamper their return. Moodus Noises Puritan settlers in the 17th century experienced this phenomena firsthand. These underground emanations sounded like thunder, or, according to other accounts, like pistol shots. The Wangunk tribe that lived in this part of South Central Connecticut believed that the sounds were from their god, Hobomoko, who sat underneath the earth and spoke gently at times, sometimes raising his voice in anger to attract attention. Earthquakes often afflicted the region. In the 20th century, scientists eventually connected the noises to tiny earthquakes called earthquake swarms. These can continue for months and are described as small earthquakes with no identifiable main shock. All right, that's it for the Connecticut iceberg. Thank you so much for watching. If you really enjoyed the video, definitely check out some of the other stuff I've made on this channel. All right, take care and good night.